investigators say marks on a single bullet found near the bodies tie Allen to the killings of the girls. Court documents state several witnesses say they saw Allen on the Monon High Bridge around the time the girls disappeared. The documents detail an interview police had with Allen back in 2017, where he told investigators he was on the trail from 1.30 to 3.30 that day. Surveillance video shows a car matching Allen's in the area at the time of the crime. Court documents state the video Libby took on her phone shows Abby walking on the Monon High Bridge when a man wearing a dark jacket and jeans walks behind her. They go on to say one of the girls mentions gun before being told guys down the hill. That audio was later released to help with the investigation. Documents say the video ends shortly after the girls start to walk down the hill. Allen was interviewed a second time where he told investigators he was on the trail that day wearing blue jeans and a blue or black Carhartt jacket with the hood. Documents say during a search at Allen's home, police found clothing that matches what was worn by the alleged killer. They also found a gun that belonged to Allen. Analysis on that gun found the bullet found near the girls' bodies had been inside Allen's gun. Allen told police he never let anyone borrow it. What we still don't know is how the two teens died. This has been one of the biggest mysteries in the country since 2017. Who killed Abigail Williams and Liberty German? Prosecutors say it was a local CVS employee, Richard Allen, that he's responsible for killing two teens. He was arrested last year and is expected to stand trial for those murders, but there's another man. Keegan Klein, he's long been linked to this case, and though he's never been charged, investigators say that Klein used a phony social media account under the name Anthony Shots, and he used that to communicate with underage girls online. And that account is also known to have been communicating with Liberty German just before the murders occurred. And while Keegan Klein has never been charged, I want to emphasize that to in connection with the Delphi murders. He has been charged with more than two dozen crimes, including child exploitation and possession of child pornography. Now, Klein was expected to be sentenced last week because he pleaded guilty to those child pornography charges, but he withdrew that. And our friends Anya Kane and Kevin Greenley from the Murder Sheet podcast they had a chance to speak with him from behind bars there in Indiana. And before we get into the specifics of Klein's case, here are some of what he told them about the Delphi murders. Do you feel you have information to speak with authorities on that case? I've already tried. They don't want to hear anything I have to say. So, and I've met with the prosecutor there and I mean, you know, you, you've met with Nick McClelland? Yeah. Can you tell us anything about what he was like or what that experience was like? I mean, he's a, he's a real nice guy. I mean, he was really super nice. And this is big. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I can't really get into any more details, you know what I mean? But That's understandable. Um, yeah, I mean, he was a real nice guy, and, yeah, I met with everyone. Do you have a sense about why they don't want to hear it? This is just kind of a broad, big-picture question. They just said they don't believe me. Okay. Um, or they, I can't, they can't cooperate what I said, pretty much. I'm just curious, did you know uh, Richard Allen? No. Okay. No. People said that he worked in Peru or lived in Peru around whatever year. I can't remember, but someone on some podcast was saying, oh, well, he lived right down the road from him in 2000, I think, four. I was like, dude, I was 10, nine or 10 years old. How, why would I know a grown man, you know? Like that. I mean, I guess, is there anything you wanted to, to state for the record or anything about some, you know, the coverage or that you would want the public to know? Um, when I get to prison, I definitely will send you a letter because I want to talk about some of the Delphi stuff. But right now, you know, I don't think that would be smart to do. Okay. But after I'm sentenced, you know what I mean? Yeah, I would definitely would like to say a few things for sure about that. All right, we do have our two special guests who are soon going to be joining us tonight from Indianapolis, but I want to play a little bit more sound from the Murder Sheet podcast, that interview with Keegan Klein, where he discusses something close to explaining why he is not going to go forward with the sentencing, why he may want to withdraw things and not go forward with that guilty plea. I do want to... Uh, 
offer the information that we have not been able to independently verify some of the claims that he makes against a relative, but take a listen to what he has to say about why he changed up lawyers right at the 11th hour. That's why I brought up to Andrew on Wednesday. That's why the court went, you know, what, an hour or so later than what it should have started because I was like, Andrew, what is going on? How do I not see these after three years of being here? How do I not get my paperwork? And he called and I heard his secretary say, well, we don't know 100% that we sell everything to him. And I just looked at him like, dude, are you kidding me? Like, I know you're a public defender. I'm not paying you, but like, you have an obligation as a lawyer to get me all my stuff. If I'm about to take a 20 year sentence, I want to see every paper or everything that's ever been said, you know, I don't know the law, you know, so I just listen to everything my lawyer tells me. So when I don't see any of this paperwork, it's like, are you kidding me? dude? We talked about, I talked about going to trial the whole time over it. And then he was like, well, they're not going to give you a deal. So, and then Wednesday he goes, well, maybe we should have taken that 10 year plea. I'm like, dude, you've never told me about a plea ever until right now. I don't know. He's just, I don't know. It's really bad on his side as a lawyer. I don't know what you would call it legal term, but yeah, it's just crazy. Let's bring in our special guest from the Murder Sheet podcast. Uh, thank you both for being on with us, Anya Kane and Kevin Greenlee. You're my definition of a power couple, journalist, lawyer, together following this case so closely. You all are the resident experts on it. Can you talk to me about first how you were able to get this kind of an interview with a man who's still in the midst of his litigation? Uh, the process got started actually a couple of weeks ago. We, we had an interview on the show with Kevin Klein's former girlfriend. He heard about that and he reached out to us via text and indicated he wanted to know what she had to say. And uh, in the past, we had asked him to do an interview with us and he said he'd only do it if we would pay him. And we didn't want to pay him. And we said, we'd be happy to talk to you about what your uh, former girlfriend said, but we're not going to pay you. And if you want to come on uh, the podcast, we can have a conversation about everything. And to our surprise, honestly, he agreed. I know from the interview that is posted on the podcast that he did, you made it clear to those who are watching, those who are listening, that he would only do it if you didn't get into too many questions about Richard Allen and the Delphi murders. But it seemed that he was forthcoming with some things on his own. What Did you learn anything new from what he had to say about the Delphi murders? It's, it's a great question. I, I think it was interesting getting him on the record, noting that he, you know, he's saying he does not know Richard Allen at all. Uh, we're sort of getting his side of that at this point. Um, and sort of getting some of that on the record is helpful for us because, you know, we can say that here's here's his line in the sand. He's saying he's not involved. He's saying he doesn't know this person. And um, I think that's helpful because there's so many rumors, right, that spread online about links between people. And so when you're asking asking one of the two people sort of, you know, do you actually know this person? And they're saying blankly, no, then I think that's, you know, maybe furthers all of our understanding. And I also frankly thought it was interesting that he confirmed that he had a conversation at some point with prosecutor Nick McClellan. And I think it's worth stressing to uh, the viewers that Nick McClellan is the prosecutor in the Delphi murders case. He is not the prosecutor in the uh, child sexual abuse materials cases. Mm. So presumably the, the topic of that conversation could only be matters related to the Delphi murders. I wanted to ask you that question. It's a great segue because you've been inside of the courtroom for all of the hearings when it comes to the Delphi murders, but I wanted to know with, with King and Klein, have you been in the courtroom and do you notice sometimes prosecutors from other cases want to pay attention to everything that's happening in a case that could impact their case? Have you noticed that? Gotten any sense of that there? That's a great question. Yeah, we've been to pretty much all of Kagan's hearings, I think, pre-trial pre hearings, and have and sort of um, tried to kind of watch about who's there. I mean, there's often a media presence. As far as other prosecutors, we've not necessarily seen that, but I can say that in the most recent hearing, uh, what was supposed to be a sentencing hearing, there uh, were a number of law enforcement officials who, you know, have you know potentially worked on the Delphi case there. Um, and I think that's not surprising because I think the investigation into Kagan, at the very least, stemmed from the Delphi murders. Whether it turns out to be ultimately linked 
is anybody's guess at this point. Um, he says it's not. A, a number of people wonder if it is. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I think at the very least, the investigation into the murders of these two girls has led to other investigations um, into crimes against children. Mm, it's important. Sometimes it's a tragic link between all of these cases. Uh, We've been saying the link, but can we dig into that for a second just to let people who may be catching up with this story, how much do we know about the communications that Klein was having with Liberty? Has that been released to the public? Do we know exactly what's in it? Do we know summaries about what's in it? Yeah, basically all we have is a transcript from August 2020 after Kagan Klein was arrested on the CSAM charges. And you have two investigators essentially confronting him saying that they know that he was in contact with Liberty German before her death um, through his Anthony Schatz account. And so, of course, um, police also linked Anthony Schatz to the Delphi murders of, you know, previously uh, in December 2021. Uh, so that's the connection. Now, Kang himself, you know, in that interview and beyond has, you know, denied being in touch with Libby, saying he doesn't remember that. And he basically doesn't know what they're talking about. But that was what police asserted in, in the interview. So um, it's kind of you're seeing, you know, not a lot of public, you know, kind of almost a Rorschach test. You're trying to interpret it like is Kagan somehow telling the truth and this was some sort of interrogation trick or were they confronting him with actual information that they have and he's sort of denying it. It's kind of hard to say from the outside, but it's something that really piqued our interest in this angle. It is certainly interesting. And Anya and Kevin, I know you all are going to stick around. We want to talk about a lot more and go into more of that interview and exactly what's going to happen with that child pornography case. That's coming up, plus a preview of what's coming up in the next hour on Closing Arguments. On the docket in Sarasota County, Florida, a trial filled with lots of bad blood. Gabby Petito was murdered by her fiance, Brian Laundry. When she went missing, Brian and his parents said nothing to Gabby's parents. Now her parents are suing Brian's parents. We have a preview of tomorrow's hearing. They knew starting on August 28th of 2021 that Gabby was dead. They knew where Gabby's body was. They knew that the Petito family was desperately searching for information, but they did things affirmatively. They didn't just remain silent. On the next episode of Accomplice to Murder. Meredith was a good girl. Until she met Jimmy Robertson. He would turn to me and say, I'm gonna kill my parents. It was like Helter Skelter. She knew enough to know I'm an accomplice. The fate of Meredith hung in the balance. That goodness had been suspended under Jimmy's spell. The spell was broken when the handcuffs went click. Accomplice to Murder with Fanny Politan. All new episode June 4th. Only on Court TV. I think a lot of people have questions of like, why, why do a plea um, when you don't have a deal, right? And that's sort of what we saw going into the sentencing. And, and what was sort of your thinking about that? I, he told me to. He told me that would be in my best interest. You save, you know, you take the, the guilt as one of your mitigating factors, and then you take taking the time and money away from the county for having to do a trial. So. And then the discovery issue sort of, in your view, kind of threw that into, you know, made you decide something else, essentially? Yeah. We know the faces of the victims in the Delphi murder case, Abigail and Liberty. But when it comes to Keegan Klein, Kagan Klein, rather, the man who has pleaded guilty to child pornography cases and is linked to this Richard Allen Delphi murders case but has not been charged, Focusing on what he has pleaded guilty to, there are nameless, faceless victims in that case. And he now is walking back away from the sentencing hearing and finishing out the punishment for those crimes that he has admitted to, but he is changing his tune now. And the Murder Sheet podcast asked him a specific question about whether or not he did what he has admitted to doing. Would you consider yourself like a pedophile? No, I would not. That's even what I put in the PSI now. When, like I told it in the PSI, when I'm out in public, I don't look at teenage girls or kids. I don't think sexually about them at all. No. What do you think happened in terms of then 
you know, some of the things you're accused of doing? Like I told the, like I told in the PSI, it just kind of spiraled out. I mean, I didn't have a girlfriend. I, you know, I was a lonely guy and I started talking to girls online and it just kind of spiraled into something. And I don't know. It just, yeah, it's crazy. He says it just spiraled out of control. Still with us on the phone now. I'm glad you all got to see them the last block. Uh, but now we want you to hear them even better. So we fixed the technical difficulty and we had the hosts of the Murder Sheet podcast, Anya Kane and Kevin Grinley, on the phone with us. Anya and Kevin, I want to ask you about the sentencing hearing that was to be. Walk us through what has changed and what you've learned now that you've interviewed him that uh, may have you understanding a bit better about why we aren't seeing him sentenced now to what he pleaded guilty to. Absolutely, yeah, it's such a great question because I mean, I think a few weeks ago, we thought we were nearing the end of Kagan Klein's legal saga because he had pled guilty to all 25 counts that he was charged with. And he was, you know, en route to be sentenced for those crimes. And the question was, how long in prison will he have to, you know, remain in order to sort of get punished for what he admitted to doing? Uh, come the sentencing hearing that's thrown on his head, he's fired his defense attorney. Uh, it's unclear whether he'll necessarily be able to walk back his plea, although it seems legally possible that he will be able to essentially say, actually, I'm going to undo that guilty plea. I'm going to just take it to trial, at least on some of the charges. Um, he indicated to us that he believes he's gil guilty of about seven charges and innocent of all the rest. So it sort of just throws everything into chaos, essentially. And so at this point, he, he is pointing the finger at a relative. He says there are these new documents. And are these documents that you have personally seen? Is it clear on the record what those new documents have in them? And do you define them? I know you've been following this so closely. Do you define them as new? Uh, it appears as if he's referring to two separate things. One thing he's referring to is the transcript of a police interview between Kagan and detectives back in August of 2020. And the other item is related to the phones. And that, according to what prosecutors said in court, was a piece of what they described as demonstrative evidence. In other words, it was something that was made to basically show to a jury. And in this piece of demonstrative evidence, they supposedly took out some key phrases from a report. And this report detailed information about who was accessing Kagan Klein's phone. And Kagan Klein did not have access to this piece of demonstrative evidence, mm. but he did have access prior to that to the whole report. I see. Well, we will see what happens in this case. Sentencing delayed. I know you all will stay on top of it. Anya Kane, Kevin Greenlee, thank you so much for joining us.